Imagine I ask you to flip one coin and to tell me the outcome, or rather to tell me the number of heads that resulted from that flip. Obviously, you would have either a tail or a head, so the number of heads would be either zero or one. This sheet lets me kind of model that situation where I can tell it the number of flips I want and it'll count the number of heads. So let's do one flip and it's a head, so the number of heads is one. Let's flip it again. Got a head again. Hopefully we'll get a tail at some point. There we go. And it tells me zero heads in that trial. So let's try two flips now. And so the number of heads uh, could obviously be zero, one, or two. Let's try that. Head tail gives me one head. Tail tail gives me zero. And if we're lucky, I'll get at some point in the not too distant future, I'll get head head. Okay, there we go. And we got a count of two heads. Now, to make this more interesting, let's um, turn this all the way up to 100 flips. And let's do that. And we get this nice sequence of heads and tails. Now I want to ask you the question, how many heads would you expect with 100 flips? And if you guess 50, that's exactly right, because on average, uh, you would expect about half of the flips to come out with a head because of the fact that assuming this is a fair coin, the probability of each outcome is 0.5 or 50% of the time. Now this particular experiment gave heads 55 uh, times out of 100 flips. And that's because the chance of actually hitting exactly 50, although it's the most expected number, uh, is actually not as high as you would expect. So let's try that again. Let's flip it again. We got 60 that time, 49, 49 again. And so the idea, there's a 56. So the idea here that you can see is most of the time the result is close to 50. Usually it's quite close, but it's not always right on the dot with 50. Now, keep in mind this idea of 100 flips. We're going to call that a trial, and there's nothing magic about 100. It's just that it um, it's a convenient, nice round number. So every time I talk about a trial, that's me giving you a coin, and you go off and you flip that coin 100 times. You count the number of heads, and you tell me how many heads you got. Now let's take this idea of a trial being 100 coin flips and dive into it a little bit more deeply. Here's a sheet that's going to let me run some number of these trials and it's going to record the frequency of these different number of heads outcomes. So along the x-axis is the number of heads seen in a trial and the, the y-axis is how often that was seen throughout the number of trials. So this will be more clear when I actually grab something. So let's say, let's do one trial. That's basically like what I showed in the previous sheet. We're going to flip a coin 100 times and stop. Let's run that trial. And this tells me that the outcome was exactly 50. Um, and that happened one time, which makes sense because we ran the only one trial. Let's run another trial. And now the outcome again was 50, which is kind of surprising to be honest. But here's 55. Uh, and each time I run this trial, this bar is moving around, so that's 51, and it's always happening one time. So this is, again, y-axis is, again, the frequency, and the x-axis is how many flips we saw, um, or, or what was the, the, the number of heads corresponding to that given frequency. Okay, let's do two trials. So we should get two bars, or one bar that goes up to, oops, sorry, I have to sort of move off that cell to lock in that value. Let's try that again. Yeah, so now we have two bars, one corresponding to each trial. Uh, 48 was seen once, and 52 was seen once. Now, it could be that in both trials I get the same result, in which case I would get one bar going up to two instead of one here. But let's do a couple more trials just to give you a feeling for this. There's a 49 and a 56. There's a 46 and a 52. So you get the idea. These are generally coming uh, out close to the center of 50, sometimes right on the money, um, and uh, very rarely sort of on the edges, the lower or upper halves. So let's go from 2 to 10. OK, there's 10 outcomes. And if you count these up, you'll see that 59 was experienced twice. And then these other values, all around 50, were experienced one, two, three, four, eight times. So 8 plus these two outcomes confirms that we ran 10 trials. If we 
keep doing this, we'll see uh, the bars kind of move around a bit, the frequencies change a bit. Here's one where um, 49 was seen four times. Anyway, hopefully you get the idea. Now let's go up to 100 and obviously lock it in again. We'll see more bars. And hopefully you're starting to see like a picture coming out of this where um, most of the action is happening in the center of the interval and then it's sort of falling off uh, as we go higher up and lower from the center. Um, now, 100 is still a relatively small number of trials, although we're actually doing a lot of coin flips. 100 trials times 100 flips per trial is 10,000 total flips. So this is kind of showing how the computer can do some things very fast that it would take us quite a long time to, to do ourselves in the real world. Now, let's change this to 1,000 trials and see what we see. And now we're seeing an even more clear picture of what we call a distribution. Um, let's even do one more factor of 10. Let's run 10,000 trials and the picture is even more clear. So we see this curve, we call it the bell curve or the normal distribution. Um, and this is seen almost everywhere in nature. And the reason is that it um, it's the natural distribution when we run trials like this, where we're doing things over and over again and calculating what the what the, all the possible outcome frequencies are. Now, um, there is this formula, which is a mathematical definition of the um, the normal distribution. And I've got this graph here. Let me make this bigger. I'm using an online uh, graphical calculator called Desmos, which is really nice for this sort of thing. So this cell here is the formula that defines the normal distribution. And it's being graphed right here. And you can see it's this perfect um, kind of bell curve shape. And it's got two parameters. One is the mean or the average of the outcomes, and the other is what we call the standard deviation, which is the spread, how far apart or narrow are the results. And I can play with these. If I move the mean, it simply keeps the shape the same, but it moves the uh, curve higher up on the x-axis, corresponding to what the, where the average really lives along the number line. Let's keep that at zero and play with the standard deviation. If I move the standard deviation, what you can see is the the higher the standard deviation, the flatter the curve, and the lower the standard deviation, the taller and narrower the, the distribution gets. So um, if I put it on 0.4, it ends up at a perfectly um, unit or a, or, or a one-valued peak. Now, what's interesting is I can go back to this graph, and I can fit that exact curve around these bars. So let me first reset. Uh, the number of trials to zero, and that should clear my, my diagram. And then um, I will open up or unhide this normal distribution column. Now the normal distribution column is basically using that math function I just showed you to, to get some data points. And so now if I do some trials, let's go back up to 100. It graphs that curve um, and superimposes it on top of the bars. So what this shows us is that when we run these 100 trials, the bar starts to look pretty close. It's not perfect. Obviously, we have these numbers here that are well above the bar and then some, some outcome frequencies here that are, that are below the bar. But as we increase this number, let's do 1,000, we will see the bars and the curve starting to get closer and closer into alignment. Let's do 10,000. And now that's starting to get really close at 10,000. And we'll do one more at 100,000, which should get um, extremely close. And what's happening is the more trials you run, the closer and closer your outcome gets to, um, sorry, it actually is taking a little while for that to run, so I ran the, the function twice, but we got one output while we're waiting for it to run again. Okay, so now it's extremely close to the theoretical uh, behavior, 
In fact, if you look at these bars, they're almost all perfectly coinciding with the curve. With the only exception I can see is this one right here is a little bit higher. Um, I think that's 49, maybe. Yeah, I think that's 49. Um, now, the amazing thing about this is there's a lot of processes where we're doing trials over and over again, and we look at the frequency of these trials, and they all um, tend to correspond with this curve. The more trials you do, as we just saw, the more closely they align with the curve. We see this almost everywhere in nature, like for example, the distribution of um, height among humans or um, the, the, the length of a flower petal. All of these different things have the, this exact behavior. And uh, it's very kind of interesting that so many things, not just in nature, but in the universe in general, like physics and all different sorts of things in science, behave according to this mathematical formula. And uh, as a result, we can predict what the variation is going to be in terms of um, the, the, out the frequency outcomes for large numbers of experiments. We can't predict any given result, but we can predict how much variation we're going to see and we can figure out what is the probability or the expectation that a given outcome or range of outcomes will be seen. So I hope, hope that helps clarify a little bit about what this normal curve or normal distribution is all about and how it corresponds to things we actually um, measure in the real world.